<laughs> Dad. Ya. Yeah. Tak dengar. Ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. Ha, dapat tak email? <coughs> email apa? Email sebab baru email a uh, Dr. Zaha tu. Kan dia tanya, dia tanya a <coughs> uh, Zoom limit pada berapa orang? Dia kata satu seorang. Hope this is enough dia kata. Hmm. Dapat kan? Ha. Dia akan Tiga tu orang eh. Ya eh, yang register dah berapa orang eh. <coughs> Ramai ke? Ramai, dah satu lebih. Seratus hmm. sampai belas. Tujuh. Oh, <laughs> Pasal ada orang masuk tak dalam tu? Zoom. Ada dalam... Uh... Ah, Google Meet ni pun on juga eh. Tu uh, tadi masuk tadi. <coughs> tadi masuk tak? Tadi masuk tadi. Uh, dah on ni eh, tapi tak ada orang admit eh. Hmm. Tadi dia masuk ada nampak tak yang slide tu? Ha ah, ada. Ha ah, okey. Betul kata dia nak masuk ni kan. 245 kan. Eh. Ha ah dia kata ah. dia nak start awal. Dan dia nak try run dulu ah. Hmm. Oh ini boleh masuk 300 ah. Ha ah 300. Ini siapa punya ni? <coughs> ini spam punya. Betul nama Mai Sarah ni siapa pula? Ini spam actually dia ada beli juga. Ada beli juga. Eh, hmm. yang waktu sekejap. Uh, pertama sekali, terima kasih. Lagi saya ucapkan kepada Dr. Zaha Zahrida Mansur hmm. kerana uh, melepangkan masa untuk uh, uh, sudi untuk men, uh, berkongsi bersama kami. <coughs> Dan uh, Alhamdulillah ini adalah uh, seminar mingguan InSpam yang ke-40 pada tahun ini. InsyaAllah uh, hari ini uh, kita ada lagi dua lagi sesi itu hari ini dan uh, dua minggu lagi dua minggu lagi dan alhamdulillah hari ini kita uh, rasa bersyukur kerana uh, kita uh, dapat uh, apa mendengar satu uh, apa uh, pementangan daripada uh, orang besar daripada Microsoft Malaysia dan hari ini juga uh, saya uh, sebelum saya serahkan kepada Dr. Zaha, saya menjemput uh, Dr. Muhammad Rizal untuk mempengurusikan sesi ini. Yang selamat datang, kita persilakan. Terima kasih Kak Tuan Rizal. Uh, Assalamualaikum Tuan Rizal. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody. Kepada uh, Dr. Zaha. Terima kasih. Selamat datang. Lama tak jumpa. <laughs> Lama tak jumpa. Tak jumpa cara macam ni je lah kita kan. Yalah. <laughs> Once again, um, uh, macam mana tu? Ada ni kejap. Lagi lagi. Satu dua tiga. Okay, it's okay lah. Okay, right. Um, so once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Zaha, uh, for your valuable valuable time to share with us your experience. Um. So I would take a few minutes to share with the audience um, a little bit of my data. Um, maybe I can share my screen for a while. Is it possible? You cannot start sharing while other is sharing. Okay. All right. So okay, now it's okay. Right. Um, right. So I would read from this by data. So this is Dr. Zarin Manso. So if you meet him somewhere in Kuala Lumpur, then just say hi. <laughs> All right. Um, he's the National Technology Officer for Microsoft Malaysia. He drives engagement with national technology stakeholders, which include academics, policymakers, and advisors, and interest groups with the intention to build trust while contributing to national development. Uh, he joined Microsoft in 2005 and has more than 34 years of professional experience in ICT and telecommunications. Um, he had his um, early career in Australia uh, before moving to Cellcom and even in Singapore, and currently he's in Microsoft, as we all know. Um, presently, he holds several associate positions, including uh, adjunct professor at IIUM, which is UIA, a counselor at PCOM, and um, academic advisor at several public private universities. Um, his education background is that he has a degree in computer systems engineering from Monash, Australia in 85. I was in standard three then. 
<laughs> um, he was awarded the Australian University Graduate Scholarship uh, to complete his PhD in computer science in 88. Um, in 85, he was awarded the Digital Award for Computer Engineering, uh, University Tasmania Award for achieving top 10 position in HSC. Uh, he's passionate about technology that we all know. Uh, he works closely with academia and has research publications as well as professional certifications in uh, various fields such as software engineering, computer architecture, cybersecurity, and so on. He aspires to contribute towards the nation's digital economy initiative. Um, with that, um, is my uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Dr. Zaha to for his sharing session this afternoon. Dr. Zaha, you have you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay now. And is the presentation on the screen? Yes. Good. Okay. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rizal. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to UPM for inviting me to this session this afternoon. It's always a pleasure to be able to, you know, somehow sometimes interact with the academia. It's always you know, nice to be amongst the acad academia because my first job was actually a lecturer in Australia, uh, you know, before you were born, eh, Dr. Rizal. <laughs> um, so, so what I like to start with is, uh, if you look around us, we see that data and artificial intelligence really accelerating the pace of this fourth industrial revolution. And what COVID-19 has done is to force upon us this dramatic changes, the new normal way ahead of time, right? So this evening is be happy to share my thoughts on why we all need to urgently accelerate our digital transformation, whether from an organizational perspective or even from a personal perspective because we have to deal with a lot of unknowns in this post-COVID era. And I strongly believe that mathematics play a very central role in all this, right? So there'll be a, an, an area where I'll, I'll address that as part of my talk. But before that, perhaps it's probably a good idea for us to level set the understanding when I talk about uh, the fourth industrial revolution, what does it mean? Because I think if I ask each of you individually what it means to you, I think I'll get different answers, yeah? So I think if you reflect at yourself, uh, when we talk about an, an, a revolution, it's a significant turning point in history, right? So if you talk about for yourself personally or socially, I think there has been changes, yeah? Dr. Rizal, if you think yourself 10 years ago or 15 years ago, right? And if you give a lecture, and your students use a phone in a class, I'm sure you'll kick them out, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but today, you'll see that if you give a lecture, these kids will be just playing with a handphone, right? And we, we assume that what they're doing is actually they're checking up on you, whether you're talking about the right thing. And I'm sure someone out there now is actually checking on my background and see whether he's a con man or what, right? <laughs> so, you know, in this new world, things have changed for us individually, right? As a social standpoint. But what about the economic standpoint? Has things really changed, right? So this is where if you just Google out this report, right? United Nations Conference on Trade and Development Digital Economy Report, not long ago, it's published in uh, end of 2019. One diagram actually caught my eye, right? And this is the market capitalization of digital companies around the world, including Asia, US, Europe, and so on, right? So that's, it's a very interesting report. So I really encourage you to read this report. Now, a, a couple of observations, if you look at, if you can see the name of the companies in there and, and note that the size of the bubble is the size of the market capitalization of the company, right? And, and this kind of old data, if you look at Apple today, it's a $2 trillion uh, company, right? It's bigger than Malaysia's GDP, eh, by the way. <laughs> uh, so 
if you look at these companies out there, you'll find that not many of them actually existed in 1995, right? The few which existed is probably Microsoft, Apple, perhaps maybe SAP, maybe Samsung, yeah? and a few others, right? But most of the others really did not exist at the point of time. They came from nowhere, right? Becoming giants today in a very short period of time, right? Just to give an example, companies like Uber became a $40 billion company just about five years, right? The second point I like to make, and this is where when people think about the fourth industrial revolution, they think about just manufacturing, right? And that's actually called I, uh, you know, industry 4.0, which is different from the fourth industrial revolution. It's, it's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. Because if you look at these companies, they come from various industries, right? You think about, okay, Microsoft and Apple and maybe SAP, they are technology companies, right? But think about Amazon and Tencent and Alibaba, they are actually retail or B2B companies. Think about Facebook and Alphabet, they are advertising companies, right? Netflix, they're a broadcasting company. You think about Uber and Grab, they're transportation companies, right? And you think about NTF, probably a company that you've not heard before, they are the biggest fintech company in the world today, bigger than Maybank, by the way. Yeah? So it comes from across the board. I think the final thing I like to say is that competition in this new world, you know, you don't know where it comes from. If I think about Microsoft about 10, 15 years ago, if I talk about our competitors, it will be the IBMs of the world and the Oracles of the world, Sun Microsystem, right? Uh, you know, those traditional IT companies. But today, the biggest competitor for Microsoft is a retail company and an advertising company, right? So you do not know where competition is coming from. And there's some of the challenges we see in this fourth industrial revolution. And if you don't believe you're in another industrial revolution, I think we should wake up. Now, if the first industrial revolution was powered by the steam technology, which changed from cottage industry to mechanized industries, transform, transportation from horse carriages to trains, for example, or sailing ships to steamships, what is really powering this fourth industrial revolution? And this is what analysts call digital platforms. Now, I, I still want to spend a bit, a few minutes explaining this because Again, if I ask indiv you individually what digital means to you, probably I'll get different answers, right? So for the, at least for the purpose of this session, let's have a common understanding. What is a digital platform? What's digital? Uh, yes, it is about computing, but it is not just about computing. It's a bit more than that. It turns out it is a combination of technologies, of powerful technologies, which forms a platform. It's a mashup of technologies, right? So when we talk about digital platform, is this combination of social and mobile, things that people use today, right? WhatsApp, Facebook, and so on and so forth. And all of you will have smartphones today. There's more you know, smartphones than Malaysians today, right? Or for, in, in Malaysia itself, for example, right? And all of this generates huge amounts of data that we need to process data in a different way, leveraging big data techniques. And with internet of things, that even generates huge amounts of data, even you know, explosion of data, right? Um, now, and if you think about this, if you had to process things like terabytes of data per hour, you try to do it in your servers, you will not afford it, right? And how these big, the small companies now can actually be successful is the fact that you have this hyperscale cloud computing infrastructure that means we're not talking about 1,000 servers or 10,000 servers. We're talking about millions of servers, which are run by these few companies like you know, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, maybe Google too, right? Where when you run computing at a scale, it reduces the cost of computing by an order of magnitude. And that is why the whole industry is moving to the cloud. When we talk about cloud, it's not virtualization. It's about the economics of computing, right? It really reduces the the, the, the cost of computing and storage. And with a huge amounts of data, cheap processing, cheap storage, that is why we see artificial intelligence actually moving, uh, you know, really having progress in the last couple of years. Now, a couple of things I like to highlight before I leave this is 
it's about a mashup of technology. It's not individual. So that's why we cannot say it's just big data or it's just IoT or it's just you know cloud. It is this combination of technologies which forms a platform. And I'll show you how that works um, in the next slide. The second point I'd like to make is, I know a lot of you say that, well, oh, technology is moving too fast, right? Uh, I have a slightly different point of view. I think if you look at the fundamentals of this technology, they've not changed much, right? Your mobile phone is just a computer, right? AI has existed in 1950s. But it is about the democratization of technologies, right? Think about it. The mobile phone in your pocket or in your handbag is probably three times more powerful than the computer which brought Apollo 11 to the moon. And it costs a fraction of the, of the cost of that other computer. And aside from that, you don't need a rocket scientist to operate that computer, right? I mean, a two-year-old probably can operate your mobile phone better than I can, for example, right? So this is about the democratization. Each of this has been democratized in this fourth industrial revolution. The final point I'd like to make is that all of this is internet connected. The moment you take internet out, it just breaks this disruptive effect that digital platform has. Again, I'll give you an example. Think about your, your smartphone. You switch off your Wi-Fi, you switch off your LTE, what does it become? It becomes a Nokia 3270, which I was using, you know, which I'm familiar with, for example, right? Now, just to show how this platform works together, think about Grab. I'm sure all of you have used Grab before, right? You know, the drivers, the passenger use a mobile phone. They, and, and really, if you think about it, your mobile phone is sending a lot of signals to Grab, right? They, and Grab is about to process these terabytes of data. And then when you ask for a car, it calculates for you the, you know, the closest car uh, from the point where you are to the destination point, how much it costs, offers you the car, and then if you accept it, then it will then you know give us you know offers it to the closest car, and whoever accepts it then comes to you. They know they know where you are because you've got the GPS turned on and stuff like that, right? Now, if you look at what's happening here, you see the interplay of all these technologies as a platform, right? You, you use social because that's you know you have a lot of people contributing to the data. You use your mobile phones by, by the passenger as well as the drivers. And Internet of Things is just your accelerometer, your GPS on your phone, even cameras. Sometimes you take photos of where you are, right? And all of that connected to the Internet, processed by Grab, leveraging big data techniques, because as I mentioned just now, they're processing terabytes of data per hour. And if you use the old ways and the traditional relational database, it won't work, right? So you need to use big data techniques to do this. And just imagine, you know, just processing terabytes of data you know, for a grab, which a startup just five years ago, where we, we haven't heard about, about this company, it was not affordable. But because they have this hyperscale cloud, which is really makes computing storage cheaper, they now can, you know, be such a successful company. And with all the data and computing that they have, they are, they are automating everything. So if you think about it, you ask for a car, at this point of time, and then ask for a car an hour, uh, a, a minute later, you find that the price may be, may be different. And you don't think that there is an army of, you know, analysts in behind there trying to figure out what's the best price. It's all automated using artificial intelligence, right? So you see how this platform works together to the extent that the country manager of Grab says to me, he said, look, if you didn't have these digital technologies, his business model will just not work. A bit more about that later. So what is really happening today is that digital technology has done two things, as Google says, right? One, it gives the power to consumers. Think about yourself today before you want to buy your next handbag or your next uh, car or raise your next motorbike, maybe, yeah? Um, you might, you know, you might have to, you, you, you probably know what you want to buy. 70% sure what you want to buy, right? So that you, when you go, you just want to browse other things, right? which means that companies and businesses have to approach their customers in very different ways, right? But fortunately, the same set of technologies has enabled small companies to have big impact. Why? Because technology has been democratized and small companies have the advantage of being agile. And that's a key point. Companies today needs to be agile, right? 
and will have big impacts. And we've seen, you know, how again Uber and Grab has been really disrupting, you know, decade-old transportation industries in a very short period of time. Yeah. And this is why Klaus Schott, the CEO and the founder of the World Economic Forum, says that in this new world, it's not about the big fish eating the small fish, it's about the fast fish eating the slow fish. It's about if you, and he says that, look, there has been never a time where, you know, it, the, 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 the technology has enabled Huge potential. You don't have to be a big company. You know, you, your small company can be super successful. And you've seen that in that chart I, I shared previously. But he is also concerned that companies that exist today, if they're still doing business the old way and they're not changed, they're still tied to this linear form of thinking and business, then I think they'll be challenged to stay relevant and succeed in this new world. As an example, so just to say that, look, as a big company, existing company, you don't have to die. What you need to do is change, right? So this is an example of a company which was very successful between 2007 to 2010. And 2007 is when Apple One was launched, right? So they were very successful for three years. And then suddenly in 2010, they just died, right? In just about three months, okay? Or five months, yeah? And, it, and you know, if we had a face-to-face, -face, I asked which company is this, and then most people say it's Nokia, right? It's not. It's actually BlackBerry. Think about BlackBerry, right? No one uses BlackBerry today. I know only about two people use BlackBerry in Malaysia today, right? I don't know why, but <laughs> they're still using BlackBerry. But that company, what, what did they have to do? Think about it. So really, if you think about it, they had to create the next S curves while they are successful. You cannot assume that if you have a successful business, you will not be disrupted and you can continue to do that business for the next 100 years. Unfortunately, that's not the way today. Every three years, you'll be disrupted, essentially, right? And that is why in today's world, company needs to have this dual personality. They need to run the matured business in a very efficient way, just like the way we do today and leverage on the digital technologies to do that. But while that's necessary, it's not sufficient because of that disruptive impact. So they need to constantly innovate. They need to operate like a startup. So they have this dual personality, right? On the one hand, structured, reduced costs, but they need to have a team which tries 10 stupid things and maybe two will be successful, for example, right? And this is not normal for traditional companies, right? So, and, and the culture of these two groups are very different. You know, this, the, the culture on the right side is, again, efficiency, left side is taking risks and getting the market from zero to a million as fast as you can. It might be even buying the market, for example, right? Now, just to show another example, I like to use Grab because they are a classic example. Um, you know, started in Malaysia, but then they moved to Singapore, unfortunately. And remember that chart just now? Unfortunately, there's no Malaysian companies in there. Even Indonesia has got a few, by the way. <laughs> All right. So if you think about Grab, you know, I had a five-side chat with the, the country manager about 18 months ago. And if you look at their interface in April 2019, they had only about four services. Right, and obviously, car was their right side of that cycle, which is the uh, mature, you know, successful business, the car hailing business. And obviously, they're starting to play around with the food industry, with um, trans, um, you know, logistics in the delivery, as well as fintech in prepaid. Yeah. Now, three months later, if you look at their interface, another three services came up. Right. Again, that, that, that innovation side of things, right? You see, now you see hotels, which is totally a different industry, right? That's, that's, that, that is uh, what, uh, you know, uh, travel, and then it's travel, trip planner, yeah? And, you see, and, and in May 2020, again, you see additional things. And if you look at your interface today, you just can count the number of services they have, right? A great example on how these digital companies today, they, they don't stop. And suddenly they are competing even post-Nasia, they're competing against 
what else, you know, uh, tune hotels, yeah. Many things they are actually competing against now. FinTech, which is, which is essentially the payments, uh, you know, the payments industry, so on and so forth, right? And these are the interesting about how companies today have to be relevant to them and succeed in this, this new world. And many of the successful digital companies, they adopt this two-sided, you know, network effects on business, where the question is, how can I create more demand when I create more supply in a very, you know, in a, in a vicious cycle that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So if you think about, again, if you're interested in this, I would suggest you to read this book called Platform Revolution, you know, really, really good book. I, I really, would really recommend this. You can see it. Uh, you can't. Okay, anyway, it's on the slide. Um, whereby they, they talk about, okay, if I have more drivers, it means I have more coverage. And I have more coverage, I have less driver downtimes. And because of competition, I lower the fare, I increase the pickups and that will attract more demand, all right? And I have to look at this in real time because you know, I want to make sure that it's a good balance because the danger is if I have too many drivers, they might say, hey, it's not worth it for me to, to, to because the, the, the cost of the fares are too low. And then what happens is that when they have less drivers, there's less dual coverage, slower pickups and so on. So it will actually reduce the demand, right? So it, it's kind of a very fine balance where you have to monitor these positive cycles and the negative cycles in real time. And this cannot be done manually, right? And that is why very central to all these businesses are data and artificial intelligence, right? But that's half of the story in terms of transforming the products in real time to engage the customers in real time because to enable this to happen, you know, you also need to make sure that your organizers, your people are empowered. Because if you look at this new world, it's about how people will, you know, are, are actually working together to create this innovation or running the operations in the most efficient way. And secondly, it's about the technology behind it. How do you operation, you know, optimize the operations of this very complex, very real time kind of business, right? In terms of managing this double sided network effect. So that is why in most organizations, when thinking about digital transformation, there are these four pillars about how you engage the customers, how you transform your products in real time, how you then enable the employees to contribute in the most efficient way, and all of this you need to operate in the most efficient manner. And in today's world, they just leverage on data and AI to enable you to achieve this. So <clears throat> let's shift a bit to data itself because this is very central. And I think this is a cliche now, everyone has heard this. Data creates opportunities the oil of the 21st century. Sometimes people say the, the, um, the goal of the 21st century. And yet, I bet when, you, when your hard disk is full, what do you do? You format your hard disk, right? And to Google, companies like Google, that's like throwing gold inside the, inside the you know, drain, essentially, right? That is how they look at, you know, why did Google build by ways? Do you think it, it, it's going to make money? No, it's free service, right? It's because you think about Google, they know you more than you are based on your search and your networking and your emails and stuff like that today, right? But they don't know where you're going. But by buying ways, now they know where you're going, right? So you can imagine for them, having more data is going to be advantageous for them, for example. This is one of those many companies. Now, what, why is data very, you know, very valuable to these kind of companies? Because of the value they can extract from the data, and that's called analytics, right? We are familiar with descriptive analytics. That's in layman's term, it's reports, static reports, okay? Everyone's got to produce these static reports. And I know that in some organizations, it takes a month to produce one static report, right? And then we talk about diagnostic analytics. This is where you have a bit more real-time access to data. You can have a dashboard. You can do, do drill down. So for example, you know, in UPM, you might say that, oh, okay, you know, our number of our students increase, but the drill down you want to find out is, okay, which of these faculties actually increase, which decrease so that you can address it in the right way so that everything becomes better in the future, right? 
Now the next phase of analytics is actually predictive analytics. No longer is about looking behind, but looking ahead and seeing what will happen. Understand what will happen so that you can make the right decision. Then the next stage is take action on what's happened. So the machine will itself take the, the required action. And finally, the advanced stuff is actually what we call cognitive analytics, where the actions are taken even when the circumstances change, right? So this is where essentially machine learning and deep learning becomes an algorithms becomes important. But to enable this, you really require a body of knowledge, which today's world called data science, right? And that is why data science is becoming kind of an important area today. It's still an evolving area, by the way, and that's why you know we don't have, and hopefully, hopefully it's not, we don't have like undergrad degrees in data science because the body of knowledge is not quite well defined, right? Now let's look at data science itself because this is underlying body of knowledge for, for, for machine learning, deep learning and advanced analytics and even AI and I'll talk about AI later. In general, there is an understanding, it is a combination of actually computer science, which is straightforward, right? Information system and mathematics and statistics, right? And it, that is why in today's, um, and if you look at this, like computer science and information are heavily towards computing. And if you did computer science, actually you need to be strong in math. You need to have N maths, right? And that is why today in Malaysia and NQA, we decided that data science should be a specialization of computer science. Now this is arguable, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll address that why that decision was made. But if I step back and look at it, right? And this is where I, I find actually mathematics is fundamental to all this, right? What is computer science? What it essentially is actually to me is applied maths, right? The principles of computer science, the much of the core body of computer science actually applied mathematics, logic, and stuff like that, right? And that is why, you know, coming in computer science, you really need to be strong in maths, right? And if you think about data science, so heavily probability and statistics. You need to understand that, right? And as computer scientists, you do learn about, you know, property and statistics quite heavily, right? So the so does engineering, for example, right? And and really, if you so if you look at most of this body of knowledge, the core of it is actually mathematics, right? Now, if you think about um, machine learning algorithms, like you know, you know, this is where an IT person will struggle. IT is not computer science. Computer science, IT is different things, right? IT is about learning how to operate systems. You know, they are expert users of systems. But if you're learning about computer science, you have to deal with this kind of mathematics. And that is why, you know, in many ways, you know, computer science is, is very heavily mathematics. And it, to me, it's, as I said, it's, it's, applied, it's applied mathematics, really, right? Without mathematics, really, you cannot do a lot of these things, right? And for you, probably this is easy, right? It's just base, <laughs> right? Uh, and some sort of optimization of those models. But this is one of the many, uh, you know, uh, machine learning algorithms that people use uh, in, in the real world, essentially, right? But why is it not just pure mathematics? I think we need to understand that, right? Because if you look at the data science process, that part of the equation, right, is just this yellow bit. The whole data science process requires business understanding, you know, data understanding. You need to be able to do some data preparation. There's, so there's a lot of programming here. There's a lot of understanding. So if you're doing AI, for example, in vision, you had to actually deal with images, for example, right? And these are the kind of things you may not cover in traditional mathematics program, right? And then you need to then deploy the systems out there. So you need to be have a bit of understanding on how systems work, how you actually install operating systems, so on and so forth. That is why in, for, for the moment that the closest kind of core body of knowledge will be computer science, but you need to have a strong mathematics in this computer science program to deal with data science essentially. But I know many universities, like my son goes to, um, is, is attending uh, University of Illinois uh, in Urbana-Champaign. 
right? When we talk about data science, they tend to put it under statistics. But guess what? There's a lot of additional subjects they do, which is like computer science. And in fact, they have a very strong computer science uh, department there. And again, if you want to go in this area, this is where you need to, you know, it's just not about mathematics itself, but you need to marry mathematics with computer science to be able to deal with this end-to-end -end data science itself, right? But as I said, at the end of the day, computer science, or they call it computational science, is actually a, just applied mathematics, just like statistics. Now, when we go to artificial intelligence, and this may be a topic which is you're not very familiar with, is this is a science where you make computers do things that if humans were to do, requires intelligence, right? And what is intelligence? Intelligence is things like the ability for humans to adapt and, you know, so if you see something else, they, they know what it is. For, for example, if you see a phone, it's a phone, but you see a, a rectangle, it's not a phone, right? So you can kind of adapt, right, accordingly, right? And adapting, if you look at, at the, 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 the intelligence, there are many, it's a bag of words, which is, makes it very difficult. And the ones which are kind of normal, normally, you know, which is practical today is things like understanding and interacting. These are the two main ones and perhaps a bit of reasoning, right? These are the main ones which are currently maybe used in many AI systems today. But what we want to focus on in the real world is applied AI because we don't have, want to have this argument or about singularity or it's about, you know, general AI where machines become like human beings. No, no. We, I think a lot of things are very narrow AI and they're, they're but then it is impactful enough to have significant implications, right? Now, I mentioned just now, AI is not new, it's 1950s. I mean, in the early days, they use what called rule-based system, knowledge-based system, where they have a lot of programming and if-l statements, which implement all this human, human capabilities, right? But in the mid eighties, uh, machine learning, learning came up where they use statistical based algorithms and rather than programming using code, they program using data. It's like teaching a kid, right? You give a lot of data and then you make the, 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 the kid answer the questions, essentially be like that, right? And what deep learning does is that now you can have a lot more deeper neural networks and a huge amount, and which requires a lot of computing, a lot of data, which means a lot of storage that allows you to move the accuracy from the traditional like linear re regression to neural network type algorithms that you know, moves from maybe 70% accuracy in predictions to maybe 95% accuracy. And that has resulted in significant breakthroughs today. So without the hyperscale cloud economics for storage and processing, without the huge amounts of data, and that's how always all these things are interrelated, you couldn't have achieved the kind of deep learning performance that you see today. And the way AI is actually being measured is based, is compared to humans. So for example, in object recognition, you give a, say, a, a, you know, 100,000 images, Humans then say what those images are. I think they had a 94.9% accuracy. And in 2016, and this, this list here is just Microsoft, and I'm, there are many other companies that have done other things, right? We beat that human threshold in 2016. That means machines at a point of time now became better than human beings in object recognition, okay? And 2017, we had speech recognition where machines are doing better than human beings. 2018, three things, reading, translation, and speech synthesis, all right? And 2019, which is just last year, we had language understanding, all right? So just a few examples, very quick examples. This is a speech recognition system where I mentioned just now, we achieved that 94.1% threshold in the 2016. So listen to this carefully, yeah? And tell me what the person is saying. Okay, not very clear, so you're not ready, so let's try it again. Uh -huh. that whole so what did she say? No idea, right? Okay, I'll give you A, B, and C. And if you're face-to-face -face and I ask this, I would probably get maybe 60% people get it right. And the reason why they get it right is not because they understood what it says, that probably the, 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 the length of that, that, uh, that sentence, right? Uh, and the answer here is uh -huh. C. 
So, you know, it was hard for humans to figure that out, but yet, you know, machines can actually quite accurately, uh, you, know, um, you know, understand what we were saying, right? So this is the advances that we have today. I'm running about time, so I'm not going to show you the other- uh, As the name suggests. Uh, the other examples, uh, I just want to maybe quickly move to, uh, to this very quickly, right? Now, one of the things that you should realize is that in today's world, uh, you know, we shouldn't, well, I think we should deepen our fundamentals, whether it's mathematics or computing or statistics or whatever. But if you're deep in your fundamentals, don't use old tools because the tools have changes, changed quite significantly. In the old days, the reason why, again, AI was expensive because you need, and data science was expensive because you need a big team. You need an IT person, you need a mathematician, you need a data engineer, you need someone with a business acumen, an application developer, and then someone who you know, manages the database and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was very expensive, right? And, but in today's world, you know, if you're bored in my talk, you can try this out, go to this howold.net, Okay, it's an app. You can upload your data and you can actually, you know, it predicts the age of the person in the photos, yeah? And of course, it's very accurate. Look at the photo of me and my daughter, right? Uh, the age that it predicts. Pretty good, yeah? Pretty accurate. Uh, but the question is, how long did someone develop this, okay? And I asked a seasoned you know, AI developer, data scientist, they say, well, maybe five people, 18 months. So it's about 100 man months of work, okay? But in reality, it was one person in Microsoft research, and I think it was a mathematician, I think, um, just took three weeks, okay? And, uh, and in the fourth week, he managed to get 50 million users. And in, in this new world, 50 million users, like 50 million customers, like, yeah? 50 million hits, yeah? likes. <laughs> and at the peak of it is 1.2 million users per hour. Right? So we are, we are talking about a very scalable implementation, just three weeks. Right? This is a kind of speed in terms of people coming up with AI-based system. And this is actually quite a very useful uh, application because now I can use this, uh, this system and, and you can read it now, in fact, because it's just a web services that you know you can take a photo of someone passing by and then predicting the age and then have, for example, advertisements which are suited for this person. So if I pass by, it probably be you know offered a, a, a walking stick, for example, right? But if let's say Dr. Riza uh, passes by, he'll get a motorbike or something like that, right? So uh, you know, so so it's it's a very you know it, it's, it's a real it's a real useful application in my opinion, right? And the, the tools are very, quite simple. It's about, for example, in this case, it's about bottle counting for Pepsi, what they had to do, because in the past, what they, they do is they send people down to the stores to figure out how many bottles would they need, right? So what they did, hey, if I can develop an application, which I just get the shopkeepers to take a photo of the area where the bottles are, and it, using AI, you can count the num number of bottles which is required or number of bottles which is left, right? That would be great. So, so a group of I think two people, what they had was they had a lot of photos of this this uh, the stores, right, where the bottles were actually uh, uh, you know uh, uh, placed. And what they need to do is for each of these <clears throat> bottles, they need to draw a box, and then they put the classification on you know what it is a Mountain Dew one liter, Mountain Dew two liter, or Pepsi Cola, whatever it is, right? So they just had to do that, and they had thousands of these photos. And once they labeled it properly, they just click a button and suddenly they created an app which can be used on a mobile, right? So this whole thing just, you know, just in a matter of, you know, two people doing it for three weeks. And that's kind of how the innovation can happen today, right? The tools you have. So again, it doesn't mean that you have all this, I know, underlying knowledge uh, you have to use the old tools because there are tools today that accelerate this. But obviously, if you don't have strong mathematics background, this is where your limit is. You can't do advanced things. And that is why I think, you know, in today's world, as I mentioned just now, you don't have to have a big team to do things and you can do things in a short period of time if you use the right tools, right? But as you can also see that 
you know, you can just buy AI. I mean, obviously, like in this PowerPoint, it's pretty straightforward, right? You can buy a PowerPoint, which now you can see down there. It does real time translation, right? <laughs> and subtitling down there, which is not great, but reasonable, I think. Yeah. So, for those of you who can't follow what I'm saying, or oh, my English is bad anyway, right? Um, but the thing is, you just can't buy this. You, it, it's kind of a, a journey for any organization because the first thing you have to do is you have the data. Think about Pepsi study. If they didn't have all those photos available, they can, they can do this in 15 weeks, uh, three weeks? No, they can't, right? They needed all those photos. So data, having a data culture in an organization is important. And to, have, to, to afford to store terabytes of data, you can't use the old ways of your infrastructure. You can't use buying servers and maintaining every three years you can upgrade with storage area networks and so on. You can't do that. It's just not, not feasible, right? It's hard to justify. But now with cloud computing where the cost is so low that you can do that. You know? A small company like Grab can do it, right? Now, once you have the data, this is when, this is where you can start to apply. And for example, in the case of, of uh, Pepsi, they use what's called platform as a service to accelerate this kind of innovations that's happening very rapidly, right? And then with strong mathematics, with strong computer science, understanding statistics and so on, you can then do what the Chinas of the world is doing, the US of the world and writing custom code and custom AI, which does even more fantastic things, right? So it is a journey. You can't just go to that AI without really having a data culture and also building up the right skills in an organization, right? But obviously you, can, you don't have to wait, you can start now, right? There are certain things out of the box you can leverage in AI, but I think you will not benefit that full breadth unless you have a strong data culture and obviously also strong capabilities. And this is where our CEO talks about what we call tech intensity. It's not just about adopting this disruptive technologies, digital technologies, but it is also about ensuring that the people in the organization is able to leverage on these technologies, understand about how to deal with data, understand about you know, how to do AI, for example, right? So it is, it is imp important in this new world, especially now with that digital transformation happening where companies need to transform this world that skills, Skill, upskilling, reskilling, relearning, whatever becomes very important. And that is why most governments today, even including Malaysia, we're talking about everyone's trying to get people to learn. And, and this is a problem, I think, in my opinion, personal opinion in Malaysia, because we don't have a culture of learning, right? Kita dah dapat degree, or dah dapat PhD, what happens? Hey, I'm the smartest guy on the planet lah. No need to learn, right? Uh, engineers think, oh, just in private, no, I thought you have right? Unfortunately, it's a problem in this new world, right? And, you know, uh, this is not the latest job disruption. I think a few days ago, I saw, uh, you know, this um, uh, World Economic Forum jobs report. You can Google it again. It's a 2020 version, but it's very similar. Jobs today falls in three buckets. One, those which are going to become less relevant or they call it redundant role. I don't think it's going to be redundant. I think it's going to be morphed to something else, right? Stable roles, right? The roles which still will be required in this new world. But the good news, there's a lot of new roles, okay? There's a lot of new roles. And we must make sure that if you're stuck in these redundant roles, we should need to move to the new roles very quickly. And that, that is why reskilling is very important, right? And as I said, the good news is that for every job loss, there's going to be twice that amount which is going to be created, but maybe different things, right? And this issue was even happening 30, 40 years ago when PCs came in play, right? People would say, oh, PCs will take over my job and so on and so forth, but really it didn't quite happen. A lot of people relearned and do, did new things, right? Uh, in this new world, same thing, right? I mean, who would I thought there was a data scientist job today, which is the top job of the world today, right? Just maybe 10 years ago, right? So now, now so we, you know, that, and there's two reasons why, because at the end of the day, humans still plays an important role in anything we do, 
is called the O-ring effect by MIT, right? And the second reason what MIT says is that humans being humans, they always want more things, right? They want to achieve more, all right? Once they have AI, they, they suddenly innovate and say, wow, there's a lot of things I can do now, right? So it creates more jobs actually, right? One thing that you have to be also be aware that even if you are in a safe job today, your job will not be the same. It will morph because the roles, the, 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 the tasks in a job may change. So Accenture did this survey whereby they say that in all, across all occupations that are relevant today, only 11% cannot be taken over by machines theoretically, all right? Because it involves things like empathy, maybe, right? Creativity, innovation, and stuff like that, which is a bit, machines are not quite there yet and probably won't be there for many years, okay? But 38% of the jobs will be totally replaced by machines. And which jobs are these? These are routine jobs. If you're doing the same task every day, these are the jobs which probably will disappear, the tasks which will disappear. But most of the jobs, 51% of the job is where humans and machines will work together because it is when they work together that they will be more productive, right? If machines only certain level of productivity, it's humans only certain level of productivity, but when they're together, it just amplifies everything, all right? And that is why, you know, again, I might talks about this thing called, you know, machine human intelligence or collective intelligence where machines and humans work together for even bigger impact, essentially. All right, and that is what is expected for all of us today. And it is for this reason, right? This professor from uh, New York University talks about what AI does is put premium on skills that humans can do, right? Things which are non-routine, for example, where you have to think that that's why leadership and stuff like that, these are the things where it's a bit more harder for machines to do, right? And because of the need for us to constantly learn new things, this is where the World Economic Forum says that from 2018 to 2022, each one of us, eh, including me, <laughs> want to worry, eh, requires 101 days of learning. Eh? So if you've not started, you better start soon, okay? Since all of you are mathematicians, this is interesting, weapons of math destruction. <laughs> and it's related to AI, why? Now think about this, right? If you had a uh, analyst which evaluates loans for a person or maybe um, insurance premium for a person or you know the credit worthiness of a person, if this person is really bad you know really bad at doing his job, at most he will impact I don't know 20 people a day, maybe 50 people a day depends on how fast he processes it right but now, if you use artificial intelligence to do this, and you don't do a good job in your mathematical models, all right, and it processes 10,000 applicants a day, just imagine what will happen. The implication is big, right? And that is why it is important that as we design AI, as we develop this, all this automation, we need to make sure that we adopt good set of principles, right? And there are many out there, IEEE and so on, but for Microsoft, we look at this six set of principles. The first is fairness. You must make sure that the algorithm is fair. It doesn't look at your face. I don't like your face. I don't give you a credit, you know, <laughs> a loan, for example. No, no, it's got to be fair, right? Secondly is reliability and safety, right? You think about an autonomous vehicle. You come to a very dangerous situation the best way for the, 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 the vehicle to perform is they take the safest thing, maybe stop by the side of the road, for example, huh? not try to go on, yeah? Or maybe when they see a yellow light, what will happen? Kalau Dr. Rizal mesti jalan terus, kan? But maybe the safe way to do it is actually to stop, right? Um, the third is privacy and security, because again, if you do not ensure the privacy and security of data, then you are not fair to the owners of the data. And security is important because if it can be manipulated, 
the outcomes would be biased, for example, right, towards certain people. Yeah? Inclusiveness is to make sure that all the stakeholders are actually inclus included in the system. So for example, you don't want to develop a system which will only work for maybe people with mobile phones. You should, the solution should also work with people who are not connected, for example. How do you do that, right? So that everyone has access to these new kinds of technology. Uh, but across all this, I think transparency is important. This is where one of the areas of research today, you know, is very actively in research because just imagine if, you know, in the case of a, you know, self drive autonomous vehicle and it gets into an accident, right? And, you know, it made the decision that rather than hitting, uh, you know, hitting a, 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 the, the bike, you know, it hits a, a bicycle. The, the, the first thing you have to figure out is, okay, who's at fault? Was it the the bicycle's fault, the cyclist's fault, or was it the car's fault, right? And if you didn't have transparency in understanding why you made that decision, it's actually a problem. And unfortunately, in many of the algorithms, machine learning algorithms today using neural networks, you know, it, it's not transparent, it's opaque. And that's why it's a kind of an, uh, an active area of research to understand, you know, why we made that specific decision. And finally, accountability, right? So when a car hits that cyclist and, you know, you cannot say that, oh, it's not, it's not, I'm not accountable. The designer said, I'm not going, it's actually the machine which made the mistake. No, you can't do that. At the end of the day, the designers, the implementers are accountable for this, right? So this is kind of the principle we take. There are many out there, but this is important because of that, you know, again, AI is very powerful. It can be used for good and bad. And therefore, if you didn't have a principle-based approach, it can actually turn out not good for, for us. Yeah. So finally, I say that, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, AI-powered digital platforms is really going to move and accelerate the fourth industrial revolution further. It's not going to stop whether you like it or not, right? So it is for us to be able to adapt and change accordingly, yeah? I think, secondly, I think mathematics play discipline is actually very important. And that's why when I was involved in the uh, recent uh, Jawatan Kuasa Pendidikan um, Negara, yeah, we want to we want say that we, we have to make mathematics interesting for students, not hard, interesting for students so that they like mathematics. And I think all you know, mathematics actually can be fun, right? But I think the way we present mathematics, especially in primary school, is kind of stressful. <laughs> <laughs> right? and, and people die, and I, I, this is unfortunate because there's a lot of very exciting <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to stop soon. Don't worry. The third the item is that, you know, if you look at, for example, that the whole, uh, you know, the whole um, uh, uh, basis of how you want to leverage on AI is a journey, right? It all starts with a change in mindset, change in culture. Because I would argue that if we, in fact, we did a survey that the problems that nation has, we don't have two problems. One, we have a data culture. And secondly, we are not embracing digital technology. We're paying a lot of money for technologies, but the old technologies. So orang dah beli kereta, kita beli kereta lembu. Right? And we train people to run kereta lembu, which makes it worse. So with that, thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran a bit over time, but certainly I hope it was useful. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And have a good day and have a good weekend. Uh, if you have questions, I'll take questions. <laughs> thank you very much for the interesting um, overview of things, um, which comes from a helicopter view, yep. um, where it sees the interconnectivity between the knowledge, uh, the technology, and um, the way the the way we perceive right now how the world is moving actually it can it can be different tomorrow for all we know yeah um, it's going to be different tomorrow by the way <laughs> <laughs> but the the idea that um the body of language knowledge um which which drives is a interconnectivity between traditional body of knowledge with technology is something that um has a quite a difficult um drive here in malaysia actually Yes. Um, yeah, we, we can see in other places where actually these things are the norm, where education integrates and um, actually drives this type of um, upbringing for their students or for their younger generations. So maybe um, 
I would like to ask the first question then. Okay. <laughs> Um, Surely the hardest, right? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's <laughs> so, is there any actually any um, in in your experience with the policyholders and so on? Um, is there any direction in, in doing this properly in Malaysia? Okay, uh, it's a it's a good question. And um, as I mentioned, I was involved in the Jawatan Kuasa Dasar Pendidikan, right? Uh, when it was. Uh, you know, about one and a half years ago, we spent six months working on recommendations, uh, especially in this area and how to deal with this thing called fourth industrial revolution. And I think a lot of people got it, in my opinion, right, uh, got it wrong. They, they think about oh, robotics and do all these things, right? I think, I think to me, if, if you look again at, at the digital technologies, as I said, the fundamentals there have not changed. Right, it's computing, right? It's computing, it's, you know, internet of th things, what are they? They're sensors and actuators. We learned that 30, 40 years ago, AI is 1950 and so on and so forth, right? But what has changed is how these technologies have been applied, how, because it democratizes at different times, right? As I said, because now your mobile phone is so cheap, now your, your smartphone is so cheap, that's why you buy a smartphone, right? Okay, just imagine it was 10,000 age, we won't be using WhatsApp, right? Okay. So my, my, my take is this, that we should make all this quote unquote core body of knowledge, right? The fundamental, what I call fundamentals or basics, right? This core body of knowledge, we should deepen it and strengthen it actually. It is counterintuitive because a lot of people are saying, oh, let's learn, mix up together, blah, 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 right? But really, if you think about it, a three or four year course in mathematics, you're not champo lagi, everything mati without that though. But I think all of us, all the degree holders should anchor on something. And this something should be a, one of the core values. If you're doing mathematics, then make mathematics as core. If you're doing computer science, make computer science as core. If you're doing engineering, don't start to make new kinds of engineering like mechatronics, couple. There's electrical engineering, there's mechanical, which existed for 100 years. Make it into a good core program. But if you look at all these core programs, there's always time for you to do electives. And that must be, must be respected. Today, we tend to kind of make electives as a specialization. Now, I like to make it more loose, in my opinion, right? Because it depends on the students who want to say, I like maths, but I want to do computing, or I like maths and I want to do a bit more deeper into statistics, for example, right? But it is when they're given this choice of what they want to do, you can actually infuse applied. How do you apply this core body of knowledge? Develop the applied skills based on the core body of knowledge you have. So, for example, I could have a major in maths and a minor in um computer science for example right can you imagine the the kind of skills that you go out there suddenly you have this combination of very strong mathematics and enough understanding of computer science to do good programming and stuff like that okay so the the thing is this the strategy should be that we should strengthen especially at degree level right i'm not talking about tvet tvet is a different strategy altogether deepen the uh fundamentals Ensure that the applied skills that you develop is based on the latest tools, not on the old tools. Then I the Fortran, right? I the Python, for example. Right? So I see what ha was happening in many universities is when they have a good core fundamental program, they open your tools in the applied program, fundamental juga. Zaman lama punya, zaman saya punya, right? Pakai Fortran dan sebagainya kan? Or universities yang just belajar aja tools je. All the latest, latest is the fundamental is that strong, which means that it's hard for the students to learn how to learn because when you have a strong fundamental, then you can anchor on that and you can learn yourself new things, right? And this is also part in terms of delivering of the program itself, you should really be very serious in getting the students to self-learn. And then your role should be just encouraging them, guiding them, coaching them, right? Because they need these skills to really develop this interest to learn themselves because Otherwise, you just spoon feed them. What happens when they leave? They don't have this self ability to learn, which is so important in this new world. Right? And they don't have that skill coming from schools. Because schools today, again, some way before 
you get students coming and say, I love to go to school. Anak you semua suka tak pergi sekolah? Ha. <laughs> Let me ask you. Anak siapa sendiri yang suka pergi sekolah? <laughs> tak ada. But you look at other countries, right? Uh, like in Australia, when my kids was uh, were, were learning in Senat Wahnia too, bila cuti, eh, they're boring. Boring. Bila berapa buka sekolah? That's how interesting school was, right? How can you do that? And that was the kind of things we were debating in the lab and how to do it. But again, you know, the, the politics has changed things and everything when a new group of people coming in that slows down. But I've seen that there are initiatives happening inside the um, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Higher Education and stuff like that. So let's just work together and figure out how to do it. That's my personal opinion. And thanks a lot for the for the information that you're sharing. So I would like to open to the others. Um, if there are any questions, you can uh, also share your questions to the speaker. So what can I be to Tiga that we can any? I don't see any questions. Uh, 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 saya nak tanya apa peranan uh, social science dalam IT ni juga. That's a very. I, I think social science is one of those sciences where it's going to become more important, right? Uh, because uh, you know this is something where it will be very difficult for machines to. To, to, to take over because you know human we don't even understand how our brain works actually right and and hence it's very hard for for us to emulate you know something like to understand social science it's, it's still a very long way and i think as time goes on with the significant social changes itself uh, there must be a you know a science behind it that, that we need to handle because one of the biggest challenges that we see today is that socially that we will be changing also quite rapidly. And if we don't manage this properly and don't are unable to predict what will happen, I think there could be many things that uh, will actually hold us behind, essentially, right? Because uh, as I always say, the biggest challenge for us as a nation, as a society to really be successful in this new world is that the biggest challenge is actually human beings themselves. We had a mindset because as I said just now, it is not about technology. Technology has been democratized, right? It is actually the people who say, why should I change? Huh? Okay. Why should I take this risk and change, right? Without that, the result. You know, UPM is a big university, right? You know, how many years do you exist? Why should we change? Nanti kalau tukar kan, nanti my boss kata, you know, you need a far, eh? That's the problem. And this is where I think if you are in social science, you should actually study this carefully. How do you break this? Allow organizations and people to take risks, for example. And that's one thing which, um, again, you know, just reflecting on Microsoft, we were doing badly, right? Until about 2014, until we had this leadership change. And one thing, one of the basic cultural move was that we went from a culture of know it all, everyone thinks they know everything, to a learn it all culture that allows you to take risk. In the past, you take risk now. You take risk, you seal up, memang matinya, right? To a culture which takes risk. Because remember that S curve? Just taking risk, right? Try new things. We are not encouraged in new things, you're measured by trying to do new things. We're not afraid to try new things, but just don't they make the same mistake twice, lah, kan? Okay. So this is a kind of I think social aspect, social science aspect that we need to handle. We, we, we are not quite there yet, right? People talk about growth mindset and so on and so forth. But I think these are the concepts which really will become very important to enable nations to be able to, you know, succeed and uh, succeed and even you know, be relevant in this new world, yeah, in all areas. I hope they answer your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, mathematics are the question of social science, huh, Dr. Rizal? Uh, we, we do everything. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. AI incarnate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> Nasib baik boleh goreng eh. <laughs> okay. So I would like to pass the session back to Dr. Rahaizad. Thank you so much everyone. Right. Have a good weekend. Terima uh, kasih. Dr. Rahaizad. Okay. Saya, saya rasa dalam chat good uh, oh, dalam chat tu ada satu soalan. Uh, boleh tak you read it out? I... Okay, okay. So um, this question is from Raja Kamil, uh, actually from Associate Professor Dr. Raja Kamil from Faculty of Engineering. Okay. Okay. So one of the challenges is the technology is moving faster than the syllabus could ever be updated. <laughs> Especially when the syllabus is updated only once every five years. Uh, so, what can Dr. Uh, Zaha suggest to overcome this? Thank you. Actually, I already answered it, but uh, let me repeat because it's a very important question in my opinion, right? Um, and 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 now, yeah, I, I think what what people are trying to do is on oh, let us change the syllabus so that it it is tuned to the latest tools or ways of doing things, right? But step back a bit, as I said just now, this digital technologies, the fundamentals of it has not changed over the last 50 years, some even 60, 70 years, all right? So that is why I always propose, and, and again, the reason why I want to start this is because, of course, MPA ni pasal lah kan? Dia tak kasi tukar cepat-cepat kan? Okay, I'll answer that too. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm part of the Majlis Jawatan Kuasa Akreditasi, kan? <laughs> so kena lah defend MKA, kan? But if you look at it, it's that most of the fundamental knowledge has not changed. So what we need to do as program is not to try to create this multidisciplinary field to try to track technology. You should create on a a feel or your, your program should be strengthening the fundamentals because the fundamentals don't change, right? AI has been around. So if you knew AI back in 1980s, it's very easy for you to learn about AI now. Because actually, it's just that you have better tools to do it today. You have better computing to do it today. But the fundamentals are the same. And I argue if you're from engineering and if you're either in electrical, mechanical, Chemical and what's the other one? Chemical, civil, civil, <laughs> right? How can I forget civil again? Do you think that the fundamental body of knowledge has changed? Even in computer science, the fundamental body has not, not changed. But what needs to be done, as I mentioned just now, is that in your programs, if you have assignments, if you have electives which are applied, make sure they are using the latest technologies, right? And let them learn themselves to use these latest technologies, right? So with strong fundamentals which is not changed and the ability and interest to learn how to learn, you, you throw at them anything, they can learn, all right? And that is a strategy. So if you think about it, back to NQA, eh? so that I really defend NQA eh? now, I think if you look at NQA, oh, tapi you under board of engineers, so board of engineers, I tak boleh buat apa lah kan? But this NQA, eh? <laughs> the board of engineers, you can uh, lobby the orang lah kan? But from NQA's perspective, I believe you can change 30% of the cost, all right? Or 20%, I, I'm, I'm not sure, eh? without actually requiring uh, NQA approval, okay? So you think about it, you know, I would argue that a majority of the courses, uh, if you have a strong fundamental, that only takes you at least between 40 to 60% already, right? And the changes that you see is not gonna happen that fast, like, like every year, but, you know, and, and if it happens, it's just changing the tools that you're using, right? And maybe some small techniques, and that is definitely less than 30%. So I always say to, Okay, I'm not familiar with engineering sangat, even though I'm an engineer. But if I look at computer science, I always tell the, the universities is that separate your core, the top the subjects which are covering the core body of knowledge yang kena buat eh, from the electives. Jangan campur. Kalau you campur problem, that's where you cannot change the courses very quickly. But if you have a very clear core and you separate from the electives, you can quickly change the electives. All right? 
So I would, I, and again, I don't know whether this applies to, I, I think it does, right? Uh, the problem kadang kita campur-campurkan, the, you know, the electives yang very fast changing with the core. So if you can separate this, make sure that the core is core, and make sure your electives can actually change very quickly, I, I can bet you those changes are not more than what NQ, you don't have to go back to NQA to get the full work, in my opinion. And that's how you make your programs agile at the end of the day. So that's just a thought. <laughs> uh, and also it's more from an MQA perspective, but again, where the board of engineers allow this, I, I don't know, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Riza, boleh buat tak? Boleh, insyaAllah, insyaAllah. <laughs> I think there is another question coming in. <laughs> oh, another one, alamak. From, you nak balik lah. <laughs> from a professor. Um, sometimes data analysis is presented as mathematics. I think the deep down, the mathematics is different than what we see. Well, I don't know uh, what it means. Maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good question because I think, I think you've not experienced on how to do data science before. And I think this is where I would encourage you. Remember that 101 days of, um, you know, learning that you have to do, why don't you take data science? Mm, yeah. Right? You take data science and then you, you'll see that, whoa, actually, you know, if your mathematics background and statistics background, I, I think that the parts that you will struggle a bit more is, oh, can about programming skate, for example, or have to manage data again, right? But really, uh, for us, from an engineering or computer science perspective, the, the part where we struggle is actually the mathematics side. Because whilst we kind of understand how to do it, we, kita, I think orang matematik ni, dia tengok matematik, dia nampak macam bintang kan? Macam, macam have a feel. Betul tak, Dr. Rizal? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. But we don't have that tau. Oh, engineers dengan computer scientists, we don't have that macam intuition tau. Yeah. And sometimes we, we struggle. Kita tengok equation ni apa benda ni kan? Tati kerawik tu kan? Uh, we don't have that intuition. And this is where I think uh, those coming from a more statistics and mathematics background, they, they have this mental model and they have this intuition when they look at things, oh, okay, this, and, and the way they can deal with this is more, I would say, is it structured? Well, if the way a computer scientist like me do it, I'll be doing trial and error, which means not as efficient. Yeah? So I would really encourage you to pick up I really encourage you, if you really like to play with data, take a professional program in data science, uh, I think you will enjoy it. I enjoyed it, by the way, yeah? I did, uh, I did a professional in data science and AI. I, I think now I'm, I, I'm in, my interest in computing is really escalated. I'm excited about it again. And I've lost this excitement for the last 30 years. 30 years. Right? And I started off, uh, you know, we are, I'm dealing with hardware, software, you know, um, new kinds of programming, approaches, object oriented, stuff like that. Then for many years, actually, it became quite boring because things became so easy. Yeah? Until now. Until now, last, I think, three, four years with AI. Yeah? And, and next, I would say quantum computing. Yeah? Mm. They are all mathematics, by the way. <laughs> it is the next thing, yes. Yeah, so you are the right place. Juma, don't just bog yourself in the theoretical. It is important. Eh? Theoretical foundation is important, but very quickly apply this theory to the real world. Go into the applied world, whether it's computing, ke, data science, ke, whatever. Lah, you know, it's how you apply mathematics in the real world. And maybe if you have a degree in mathematics, take a, either a professional course in certain areas of interest at top masters in certain area of interest so that you, you have this mix because your, your foundation is really good you know as a mathematician in my opinion terima kasih terima kasih nama there is another question but i think this one you've answered um, which areas will be affected by ai so i think um, maybe if you can share the slides you can no no, no, no I, very quick one i think it's important right. just to understand um, basically it's very like this right it, it, don't look at the jobs, jobs. Look at the task, at the task level, right? If the job involves a lot of tasks which are routine, these are the ones which are highly probable going to be taken over by AI. So move to higher value tasks where 
every day is different for you. Mm. And that makes you a bit more resistance to AI because AI is not good at innovation, at empathy, for example, and so on and so forth. Right? So I hope that kind of gives you a, a feel on how, uh, you know, where you should be. Yeah? Kalau you buat the same job every day, memang lah. Tunggu je lah. Mengajar hari-hari, habislah. Kenalah tukar ajar every day. Every day. Ha, cara dia tukar, right? Jadi besok cara lain, you know. Do flip classroom, guide people, coach people rather than teach them. Janganlah pakai lecture, apa, lecture slide yang you dah buat the last 20 years. Ha, itu memang nak kena tukar. <laughs> okay. Sorry eh. <laughs> I know all the tricks of lecturers, okay? <laughs> Right, so I think I rise up. Okay, sekali lagi uh, terima kasih kepada Dr. Zaha atas perkongsian ini. Saya rasa uh, dua jam pun tak cukup kot. Tiga jam pun <laughs> <laughs> hey, cukup. Okay, cukup lah tu. <laughs> okay, uh, sekali lagi terima kasih kepada para... Terima kasih banyak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Okay, kita jumpa lagi insyaAllah. Terima kasih semua. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.